Hottie, it has been an intense weekend. <laughs> yeah, I've been following you. A lot of racing in the Nelson family, right? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, it, it, so many of us, and you know, all with some interesting results. So we just finished the Silver Rush. Uh, Lisa did the 50 mile run on Saturday and with my twin daughters and me crewing for her. And then yesterday, Sunday, we're recording on Monday, or what day is it? It's, it is Monday, right? Yes. It's <laughs> so on, it, you lose track of time when you're on vacation. So on Sunday, uh, yesterday, as we're recording, both Lisa and I did the 50 mile mountain bike race. And it has been you know, amazing, rewarding weekend in a lot of ways. I learned a ton actually uh, at this uh, event and I want to talk about it. Uh, but before we get to all of that, I want to blow your mind with this absolutely incredible discovery I made. It is the ultimate Floyd's post all day race recovery McShake. Ultimate. Now, that's a powerful yes. word for a recovery drink. It better <laughs> be at least as good is my power green smoothie I make using Floyd's recovery protein. Oh yeah, uh, we let out the episode with that uh, recently and, and and that does sound incredible. You know, we ought to do a head-to-head -head comparison when we, when we get to Leadville uh, in a couple of weeks. But mine's super simple. And I think that is part of the attraction. Here it is. Two scoops of Floyd's vanilla recovery mix, eight to 10 ounces of whole chocolate milk, blend. It is so good. It is delicious, a lot of quick calories and protein, uh, with, you know, no small amount of fat when you use whole milk. And it saved, I would say, Lisa and me from a full on post race uh, crash after, you know, after, you know, for Lisa two days and for me, you know, a very hard one day. I truly recommend it as long as you're okay with milk. If not, grab some almond milk. You'll be just fine. Yeah. Uh, be yeah. sure to check out Floyd's of Leadville for us, our presenting sponsor at floydsofleadville.com and use the code fatty at checkout for a 15% discount on your first two orders. Yep. And thanks Floyd's of Leadville for sponsoring the show. Three. Leadville, the podcast for the 100-mile mountain bike race, presented by Floyd's of Leadville. It's season two, episode 18 of the show that breaks down, builds up, gets you ready, and freaks you out for the highest and hardest one-day mountain bike race in the country. You know, I am kind of freaked out right now, and I just finished a race. Uh, I am, of course, in Leadville right now, the day after the Silver Rush 50. I still have kind of post-race scrambled brain, as you heard is, <laughs> at the intro of this uh, particular episode. And I've got two hours till I got to check out of my Airbnb and get back to real life. Uh, and I just did a really good interview with uh, the director of Cloud City Wheelers. We'll have that in another show. I've got a lot to talk about in this episode, Hadi. I've got key learnings uh, from my first serious crewing uh, attempt. I've got my impressions and thoughts from the race and some, I would say, important things that I learned during this. And then in addition to that, we've got a great post-Everest nutrition tips from Roxanne Vogel and some critical insights for any home mechanic who doesn't want stuff to fall off their bike from Ryan Morse. Uh, I also want to give you a quick reminder. You and I have a really great Leadville podcast t-shirt now. If you've been enjoying the show, maybe let us know by sending us a 20 spot and showing the Leadville pod some love. Get yourself a cool t-shirt in return. And I think you'll agree, it looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's not a real podcast until you have a t-shirt to go with. So now we are a bona fide, <laughs> yeah. legitimate podcast and this oh, yeah. t-shirt is available or for order right now in both men's and women's sizes plus we've got a code for our listeners so you don't have to pay for shipping that's right you just go to bit.ly slash leadville t-shirt all is one word and at checkout use the code podcast to get free shipping and that's a significant discount i promise you again that's bit.ly slash leadville t-shirt and use the code podcast to get free shipping <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, Hadi, let's talk about my Silver Rush experience. But I don't really want this to be just a pure travelogue. Uh, I learned a ton out there this trip, and I kind of want to talk about some of the main takeaways that I've got from this weekend. And to be honest, while the, my own race was important to me, I think the highlight of this trip was what I learned about crewing. Oh, so you're going to tell me how to do my job now. No, I wouldn't dare do that. Uh, I know you have your, uh, way more experience in this, and you've got your own system for this, and I'm not trying to tell anyone how to do it, but I learned a lot as a first-time serious crew. And, you know, Lisa obviously had some serious objectives in this event, doing a 50-mile run, and then in such a way that she was okay to do a 50-mile r- uh, mountain bike race the next day. And I knew that my, you know, my uh, success or failure could impact her success or failure for, you know, for this pair of incredibly difficult races. So all I'm saying is just sort of think of this as some good takeaways from a first timer. And here's the first, here's the first one. And I don't know if this is the most obvious thing and I just realized it or if this is a real insight, but shared documents are amazing. You and I are obviously working from one right now. Uh, you know, listeners won't know, but you know, Hadi and I script everything out using Google Docs. Um, what I used for this particular event, since everyone uh, who would be crewing would be using an Apple device, is I used Apple Notes. And that way I knew that any changes I made in our shared Apple Notes would be automatically updated on everyone's device. They would know what is going on. Um, so, uh, you know, whatever you use, you know, Google Docs, Apple Notes, whatever you like to use, use something that updates easily so you don't have to use a ton of email threads and SMS updates and so forth and keep everything that is important in there from your location, the distance from place to place, the projected time that the racer is going to be coming in and do everything by race time, not time of day. Uh, you know, what they're going to need, who needs what, things to bring, all of that. Uh, also include things that the crew is going to need. Chairs, hats, sunscreen, insect repellent. In our case, it's mosquitoes are out in force this year, Hottie. Mm. It's incredible. <laughs> and of course, uh, crew food. Uh, by having all of that in one doc, everyone knew where they needed to be, what time Lisa was hoping to be there. And it just made it so that it was really simple for us to stay synced. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, shared docs is a great way to get business done, to get work done. Fatty and I are proof of that. This podcast is proof of that. But for all, you know, it doesn't work in all cases. For instance, in my career situation, in Leadville, we have a great guy that, that helps us every year. He's lived in Leadville for a number of years, but he's not quite in the smartphone era. I think the last time I checked, he still had like maybe a flip phone or something like that. So we, <laughs> you know, we worked on paper, which worked fine. It works excellent mm-hmm. as long as you have a system where everybody's kind of writing down uh, the same thing. Regarding your note on projected time and time of day, we actually would use both, Fatty. We would say, what's going to be your projected time and what time of day do you think you'd be there? That way you can cross-reference when your racer might might get there too. Mm-hmm. You know, I I had planned to do it that way and I actually went back partway through and I just deleted the time of day stuff. I said, okay, we are all living on race time this day. You know, and I had everyone who was going to be crewing start a stopwatch, which everyone has on their phone at the, you know, when the gun went off. And for that day, we didn't talk about 10 a.m. or noon or anything like that. It was hour one, hour two, 30 minutes, and just kind of kept it that way. It's kind of, and, and that way, when our racer, when Lisa said, how am I doing? What's my time? We didn't have to do conversions. It was like we were all living on her time that day. Now, you know, do we, anyone can do it whatever way works for them. I'm just saying that worked really well for us to just sort of live on race time during the race. So, you know, it, it, you know, whatever, whatever for sure works for you. Um, the one, the next thing that I thought was really useful for us was uh, planning ahead your uh, your crew spots and doing that with the racer if you can. 
it is super nice for the racer to know exactly where they're going to find you. So the day before the race, we drove to uh, the places we were going to crew for Lisa and I would tell her, we're going to be at this spot or at least as close as possible to it you know, on race day. So she could look for us. And I know that you all, you know, that you always do that too. Yeah, we've got, and especially at, um, well, first of all, we use the alternate feed zone at Twin Lakes. So it's a little more obvious there where you're going to be, although we still try and to take at least the full crew out there to show the spot we hope to get at Twin Lakes. Um, and then at Pipeline, you know, and again, in, in the mountain bike race in the 100 miler, Basically, there's only two spots for your crew to go. It's going to be Pipeline, or well, there's three, but they're going to have to pick two or three. There's Pipeline, Twin Lakes, and Twin Lakes Alternate. And so those yep. are only the three spots or two spots you really need to scout out. And if you can't, if your racer can't go, if they're too busy, what we did was we took crew out there via car, figured out where we wanted to be, and took pictures of it and brought it back mm. to the racer so we could show them, look for us here, or here's how far it is from the timing mat. Uh, where we're going to try and set up and here and we'll be on this side of the feed zone so that's how we handled it if our racers could not or did not want to go out there yeah that's a really good idea i i had not thought about doing photos but that makes really good sense just as long as everyone should know where they're going and where they will be now of course because you're not the only crew that's going to be out there you have to have to assume that sometimes you might have to shift around. So you want your crew, you know, whoever whoever the crew is, to be easily findable. In in our case, what we did is, and this is this is going to seem you know kind of simple and silly. I had a straw cowboy hat on. In, initially, I bought it at a grocery store just because I wanted to keep the sun off of you know my receding hairline. But um, it turned out to be something that was really easy for Lisa to pick out. Also, one of my daughters was wearing a, a, a pink hoodie. And, you know, between those two things, we were simple to find. And, of course, on the flip side of that, um, knowing, you know, what Lisa would be wearing made it easy for us to pick her out as she was coming up the trail. And, you know, she was wearing a, a red uh, visor, a bright teal uh jersey and uh some pink gaiters and so you know that combination of colors made it pretty easy i was given to understand that what i wore at the race made me almost invisible during the race because my uh my hydration pack is black my shorts are black my helmet's black my glasses are black it's just like i'm I, i'm about the most anonymous racer there could be um it's you know having something that identifies you makes things a lot nicer for the crew. It, it, what do you do to make yourself findable by crew? Oh, well, I used to race for a team called Big Orange. My good buddy, Greg oh, yeah. Leibert, who maybe you've met. He's been to Leadville before. He is the designer of the kit for the Big Orange Cycling Club, and it mm -hmm. is loud and proud. It is very orange and sometimes uh, sprinkled with some other colors and very hard to miss. Uh, one of the best kits. We used, the, we used to race in the kit on the road because it was... Uh, the reason why he designed it so loud, because it was easy to pick out your teammates in a crit or in a road race. And the same goes for your crew. You put somebody in, in a big orange uh, vest or a jersey and put them out there in a feed zone, and they're really easy to pick out. So as a crew chief, or when I was in crew, I would generally wear that old kit or the jury or the vest or something, you know, that I could stand around in or, or could pull on as I knew my racer was getting close. So that made me stand out a lot, a lot. Uh, another, one other note regarding day before or prep, and that is have a meeting, do a racer meeting and sit your racer down with your crew and have your racer detail what they expect at each stop when they expect to be there and what they expect, what they want at each stop and write each of those pieces of information down and assign them out to specific people so they know what to do. So have a meeting, verbal, talk. But, yep. Yeah, have the Google Absolutely. Lock or have the thing on paper, but talk it out too so you, you have an understanding that way. Yep, and essentially that's what we did the night before was we, we did almost, you could call it a dress rehearsal is by we went through the, through the document 
and we had initials for each person's responsibilities for at each of the places. And uh, by going through that and having the stuff actually there saying, okay, here, I'm going to be giving you this. I'm going to be taking that from you. It is a great gut check to make sure that all the things that are on your plan are actually going to be going out with you to the event because it's easy to forget something. But if you've practiced with the actual stuff and looking at the document, at your plan, you can find out where there are holes in your plan, where you have things that are supposed to be done but aren't assigned, and you make sure you have all of the stuff with you. It seems like over-preparing. As a very type B person, I normally don't do this, but being a crew is a great time to, you know, find the type A person inside of you so that the racer who is not going to be thinking well and is going to have, you know, scrambled race brains will be able to rely on you to do their thinking for them. All of this so far has been about planning for the race day. Now I want to talk about the day of crewing itself. And that was pretty simple. Um, And the overarching theme with that was we made the day about crewing and nothing but crewing. Originally, we had planned to, you know, between in a place where we would have two hours with, you know, where we would not be seeing Lisa, we were planning to go back into town and get something to eat and maybe do a little bit of grocery shopping, buy some snacks or something like that. Instead, we decided, no, we are not going to risk a traffic jam coming back out to the course we brought everything with us and we made sure we were very early at each spot. And that way we never had to fight for parking. It was really great. And we also made our crew setup super portable because we, it, the parking situation for the Silver Rush 50 is, you know, just cars for miles, you know, parked alongside a road. And, you know, so you can't just park and set up. Um, so what we used was the Banjo Brothers large commuter backpack. It was our total, uh, you know, our total go-to kit. Um, I held in Lisa or in this pack. I had all of Lisa's water, her food, uh, her trekking poles, uh, her foot tape, uh, a med kit. I had a pair of extra shoes for her. Honestly, everything she could possibly need, I had in that. And meanwhile, one of my daughters had another commuter pack because I have two, and she carried all of our food, you know, the crew's food and stuff like that. And then the uh, my other twin just carried our um, carried our uh, chairs and so forth. And the three of us were able to easily pack it in, pack it out, move very quickly. Uh, and Banjo Brothers made our uh, our crewing experience just awesome. Yeah, while the LT100 provides a parking that's a little closer to your exact crewing spots, it, you, no guarantee you'll be right up next to where you're going to be standing. Uh, you won't be standing right next to your car as your rider comes by. So be prepared for the LT100 to be portable as well, to be able to move about a little bit. And a good pack is one way to tackle that job. You can get oh, yeah. 15% off your order by going to banjobrothers.com forward slash fatty dash favorites. Banjo Brothers is tough, practical, and affordable, Minneapolis-based, in business since 2003, and they're great guys. To get 15% off your order, go to banjobrothers.com forward slash fatty dash favorites. All right. And the last thing I want to talk about with, uh, as far as crewing, is attitude and approach. Uh, One thing that kind of occurred to me while I was working on this is being a a racer, a committed racer, gives you a lot of the tools you need for being a really good crew chief. Uh, You know, as someone who races a lot, I know what the racer's mind is like and that you're not necessarily super lucid and super coherent when you are coming into an aid station. And so I, I had a pretty good sense of what Lisa would be feeling like you know, at six hours in, you know, the, there was a good chance she might be feel, having some GI issues from, you know, six hours of goo and water and uh, energy drink mix. And, you know, so I had stuff ready for her that she didn't necessarily expect. And I seemed like I was 
prescient, like I had supernatural, uh, you know, supernatural psychic powers when she came in and said, I'm not feeling great. I, my stomach is bad. I'm like, here are the, here are the gas pills that you uh, thought you might need sometime during the day. And, you know, she was like, wow, how did you know? I was like, because I've raced before. <laughs> right? I know, I know when you start experiencing that kind of thing. And that kind of reminds me. I used a lot, I, I was wearing a long sleeve uh, jersey most of the day. And those make the a crew chief's, they're, they're really the crew chief's best friend. I, I, in my left pocket, I had some spare gels. Uh, I had some off menu snacks, you know, things that I, she didn't say she would want, but, you know, just some salty stuff that would be a little bit different and a little bit of a change for her. Uh, I had, you know, some gas pills, I had lens cleaners. Uh, you know, all in different pockets. I knew exactly where they were that I could grab at any time as she came through. It is really nice to have everything set up on a table, but you're kind of you know, working and moving with them, especially during a running event. And it makes it really nice to be able to just grab something out of all the multitude of pockets that you've got in there. Yeah, that's, um, a, that's the interesting thing about the running event is that you, yeah. that I was reading into the notes you'd put down here was that you actually move with the runner as they come into their pit and start that's handing right. them things. They slow down, I gather. They slow down a little bit so that you can deal with them. Yeah, Lisa would come uh, would slow to a walk as she as she would get to us and we would do I mean basically we did a a a, a walking uh, pit crew, you know, just she would hand one of the twins her her bottle or her uh you know, she has a a pack I kind of like the Osprey that you were talking about in a recent show but hers is a Solomon. And, you know, would we'd be filling that out and swapping out gels and things like that. We would stay with her. Obviously, you can't do that on a bike so much. But the idea it really still applies is that you want to have your racer not in motion as little as possible. And if you as a crew can keep your racer from never being uh, not in motion, then you are an awesome crew. You really are. Yeah. The bike event, you can try and pull off a feed on the fly. The rider has to be really up for it and know what they're doing, though, to do it right. And, of course, at the bike event, you're going to have tools and other things that don't come with a running event. So right. full stops are generally the idea. But the same principle applies running or riding, and that is fast turnaround. You want these to be pit stops and not full stops, if you can yeah. at all make that happen. Yep. And yeah, I've seen people use the, uh, the little bags and what are they called? Um, the, the musette bags. Hand. Yeah. Musette bag. Uh -huh. Thank you. I, I, you know, still got, still got uh, a little bit of post-race confusion in my mind, but I've seen people hand those off in the Leadville 100. I have also seen people crash as those have been handed off in the Leadville 100. And of course, Lance Armstrong was famously taken out by a musette back in the in the Tour de France mm -hmm. a long time ago. So those handles can, if you if you don't know what you're doing, be careful with those. <laughs> Just make sure that however you are handing stuff off, if you were trying to move fast, be safe with those uh, and only use things that you've practiced with. But one thing you don't need to practice with is cowbells. Uh, each of the twins and I had a cowbell with us and we would just, we made sure, and Lisa said afterward that she, more than any clothing items, it was the cowbells that made it so that she knew where we were because there was always a trio of cowbells just going nuts as she came by. We also used those for other racers as they would go running by us, you know, just yelling for them, cheering for them. Every racer out in any serious race, whether it's running or riding, can stand some positive energy. Uh, you know that. It, it, it'll bring a racer out of a dark place and make them feel like they can, you know, they can keep going. So it is just, you know, if you are a crew, bring some cowbells. Put that at the top of your list. Yeah, remember this if you've not raced before, is that the racer is thinking about you a long way out. It's like a mini finish line. Each crew stop, they consider a little finish line, like if I could just get there, they're going to have this thing for me. I'm going to see someone I love and who cares about me. Yep. So they've already got the mentality. They want to get, they want to see you. So make it a welcoming thing. Don't just sit in your lawn chair and go, oh, grab your gels and be on your way. That's not how it <laughs> works. You're racing with them too, and they need all the, 
the encouragement you can hand out. All right, take us to race day now, to uh, the okay. start line. Sixth, is it 6th and Harrison for the 50? Where does the 50-mile run start? Oh, oh, the Silver Rush starts at a completely different place. It starts at the base of what is called Dutch Henry Hill, which is a sledding uh, a sledding area. And you start the race, both for the bike race and for the running race, by running up this really steep sledding hill. And I, by steep, I mean, it, it is a tough walk. I, I you know, I, I wish I would have looked at the, uh, at my, uh, gar at my Garmin, uh, percentage on that, but I would guess 25, 28%. I mean, it is just, you are really, uh, I, I personally was using my brakes to kind of help me, you know, to, you know, push forward, use my brakes, pull up, and you know, sort of using it almost like a walker to help me get up that hill. But they do that for the run too, and there's kind of an ex some excitement about it because the um, there are two lifetime staff members who stand at the top of that hill, which is where they actually have the timing mat and the race begins. The first man and first woman who gets to the top of that hill, there is a coin waiting for them, and they can use that to get into the uh, Leadville 100 running race or mountain bike race, depending on which race it is. So there is a hard Le Mans style uh, run uh, up a hill before the race even begins. Now for the running race, that started at 6 a.m. And just sort of as an aside, make sure you take lots of your own pictures. I don't know if this is a new thing uh, that Lifetime is doing, but as far as I can tell, they switched to they are, are switching to a different business model for photos where you don't get your photos free as part of the race anymore. Now you have to pay for them you know, through this other you know, company that is taking the pictures. I'm not super stoked about that. I've always really liked that there are a number of really nice pictures of me that come as part of my race registration. You know, it's, the race is not cheap. Having some pictures of you seems like a reasonable thing to have in there. So, yeah, you know, whether Lifetime decides to go with that or not, they've at least heard my voice on that. I would say go back to the way that they've been doing it. So anyway, as soon as uh, Lisa charges up that hill after Ken fires his shotgun because both Ken and Marilee are there and, you know, they are, you know, they're, you know, telling people to dig deep and, you know, more than you think you can and all of that. And Lisa charges up the hill and Katie and Carrie and I head to our first crew spot, which is just about seven miles in, uh, maybe nine. And we are there in plenty of time to see the race leaders, in fact, come running by. And Lisa gets there right on her, uh, on her projected time. She did a great job with her projected times. Carrie takes off the cap. Katie fills a bottle. I stuff Lisa's pouch with uh, a couple of extra gels. And off she goes. You know, no time stopped. And she goes up and down a spur that totals about seven miles. And that takes you to 12,000 feet. So it's a, it's a big climb for the day. And then we have about an hour to move to the other side of the road where that spur comes out. And by then things are a little more hectic. So she's going to move from bottles to a pack. So we take the bottle, put the pack on, and she makes a game time decision, which turned out to be a little fateful to pull out of that uh, pack her sh uh, gore shake dry jacket because it, the sky was clear and it doesn't look like it's going to rain. <laughs> and you can tell where I'm going with this. Uh, we put uh, her headphones on and I make sure that they are playing and she gets out the door you know, and she's gone. It, we do this in seconds. It works, works great. And then we have a couple hours. Um, we go back to the apartment, change into clothes that feel more like summer, less like winter, <laughs> you know, 6 a.m. It's cold in Leadville. Uh, and then we are uh, back to the Stumptown turnaround aid station where it's she'll be 25 miles into this race. And that is uh, that finishes with a hard uphill uh, hot, uh, or to, to get to that aid station. It's a hard uphill hike. And the parking gets super packed, so we had to give ourselves plenty of time for that. Using, using backpacks worked out great for us. We got there early, and we had no problem and got the exact spot we wanted and got all set up. Lisa came through, and this is 25 miles into the race, within three minutes of her projected time. I mean, she's, she's running like, like a clock. And I got to say... Hitting those projected times was so nice for us. We didn't have to spend any of our time, 
you know, going into what if land. What if she's her? What if she rolled her ankle? What if she got made a wrong turn? What if she, you know, she's having GI issues? There are lots of things that you know can go wrong during a race, and a worried crew will start thinking of all of them and more. And um, it's it's really nice to have you know the most accurate possible uh, crew uh, projection times uh, for the crew. Yeah, splits are so important, not only for the racer themselves, but for the crew. And so it's great to have your crew, give your crew, that is, if you're a racer, a projected time or, you know, the fastest time you you think the race will be there and then maybe the slowest time. And the other thing you can do crew to crew, if your crew is kind of split up between two groups, is you can use text messaging, provided it's working in Leadville, to advance notice your, the crew, next crew up the road. Hey, just came through, and this time they just left our crew spot headed your way. So that's kind of how we would work it during the uh, the LT100 mountain bike race. Yeah. I If I remember right, at Twin Lakes Dam, your odds of getting a text uh, through are pretty weak. I think that, frankly, the Leadville uh, cell towers – aren't built to handle that that volume of traffic. So don't count on uh, don't count on a good uh, cell phone connection, but certainly use that if uh, if you can. You know, it might, it might sneak through. Um, anyway, so Lisa, she, her headphones, of course, were not working for her. I put them on my ears. I pressed play. They worked fine. Technology hates my wife. I, I, I can't explain why or what happened. Anyway, she also had a really bad chafe on her collarbone uh, where her pack was just rubbing against the hem of her of the jersey she was wearing. So we sort of moved some things around while she ran through the aid station and we had her pack ready to put back on her as she came through. You know, she took off and we had two hours to get back to our original aid station, the the printer boy aid station, where we would see her for the uh, fourth and fifth time during the race. And it was so great to be a, you know, a portable crew because we had we really had a big hike to get back to our car and then we had to park far away from the printer boy aid station so you know having it all uh in in ways that we could just carry from place to place in this case worked great and here's where our deviating from the plan actually started giving us a little bit of trouble if you remember back earlier when i was talking i said that lisa said Get rid of this jacket. I don't need it. At the time, that was right. But anyone who's ever been to Leadville knows that a a good, hard rain and thunder and hail storm can come in practically on a moment's notice. And that happened. Uh, we were we were standing waiting at the side of the road. I asked my twins, "Did you feel a raindrop?" And within one minute from then, it was just dumping, and I mean dumping buckets of rain and slushy hail. And we were debating: is this hail or is this just really wet snow? We didn't know for sure, but it was bad. Uh, so you know, we were like, "Ah, should I mean by saving her, Lisa an ounce and a half in in her pack?" She, uh, you know, Lisa had no jacket and she was out there in this mess and we were cowering under the Lifetime Fitness uh, pop-up tent, um, which we had to keep, you know, pushing a chair up to keep uh, the the hail and snow and water from uh, collapsing the roof of the thing. So it was really gnarly for about 10 minutes. Have you ever been out there uh, during a a hard uh, and sudden rain slash snowstorm hottie? Oh, of course. I mean, this is what people need to expect about the high country, about Leadville, is that rain can just move in at a moment's notice. The great thing about the Leadville Race Series is that, you know, I think they targeted these dates to Mm -hmm. be, uh, you know, ideal as can be for weather up there. That said, there have been times when the the race itself has been hit by rain. Chances are you're not going to need anything during the LT100 as far as rain gear is concerned, but, but... You should put it everywhere. Put it at all your crew stops. Put it at the top of yep. Columbine. You never know. You might need it. And there's some really good jackets that weigh practically nothing. It is not a bad idea to have something that you can wear, you know, especially uh, for the time when you're going up and down Columbine where you're at 12,000 feet. A rainstorm can be a snowstorm, can be a hailstorm up that high, and it can really be severe. It can, it can really diminish your 
capabilities in in short order. So that is something at least you should have uh, at the Columbine turnaround uh, for a drop back uh, so that you can get down safe. Anyway, back to this race. Um, Lisa got to us once again, right on time. She just nailed her projected times the whole day. She dropped her pack. She took a bottle from us for the seven mile out and back spur. We, and by now it was sunny again, by the way. I mean, this, this rainstorm lasted 15 minutes and then it was sunny the rest of the day. And, um, you know, of course this time I made her carry a jacket for the rest of the race, which she never needed. Um, but we saw her one more time before she made the, headed out for the nine minute final, uh, sprint, I guess, <laughs> to the finish line. We found a place close to the finish, uh, on the mineral belt bike path, uh, right before Dutch Henry park. And there I, I'm going to deviate to a pet peeve for a second, hottie. And this is a do not do for spectators. There was there was a group of people who were really close to us. They were yelling out what I would call false encouragement to racers. And you've probably seen this before. They were the people who were yelling, you, you're almost there. You've got less than a mile to go. When they still had like two or three miles to go, which includes a hard climb in the final mile of the race. I don't know if they didn't know or if they were trying to be funny or I don't know. Have you ever seen people do that? Spectators who are giving encouragement that is misleading and can be really demoralizing to racers. Well, I've seen it, but I know to ignore it as a racer, first of all. As a crew member, I just go over there and say, hey, guys, maybe not the best idea considering what's ahead of them. So it happens, you know, people want to be encouraging. They just don't know always the right things to say at the right moment, but it's, you know, it's what comes with the territory. It does. It does come with the territory. And I will say uh, your point to racers is spot on. Uh, When you are a racer don't ever think that a, a that some random spectator that you you know that you do not know has great beta on the race or on the course. Uh, if they are saying you are almost there and you've got a mile to go, when you, according to all of the knowledge you have, have three miles to go or you know seventeen miles to go, it's you know what you know. Uh, supersedes what they are telling you. So accept the spirit of what they're saying, um, but not necessarily the substance of what they're saying. Anyway, so Lisa comes down and we we see her coming uh, coming down the mineral belt uh, loop trail. You know, this she's back on the pavement at this point. She gets to us. We have a, a bottle of water to top her off for the last couple miles of the race. And for the first time in the whole day, she is just feeling wiped out. And I, I'll, I'll never forget what she says. She gets to us and she says, just shoot me. <laughs> she is just completely wiped out, exhausted. She has put in such a hard day. I mean, she is 47 miles into a, 40, into a 49 to 50 mile day. And she has put everything into it. She is just so cooked. But, you know, we give her some encouragement, we ring the cowbells, we fill up her bottle and we send her on her way. And she winds up cr- you know, crossing the finish line with a great sprint, believe it or not. She is the 25th woman overall in the Silver Rush 50, second in her age group. They give her the, the, uh, the gold mining pan, which is the traditional trophy for the lifetime Leadville series. And lays down on the ground. <laughs> she is just completely zonked. Uh, we had, uh, it, you know, just a, an amazing day. She hit her goals. Actually, uh, 9.53, 9 hours, 53 minutes, 7 minutes faster than her best projected time. I mean, honestly, you could not have hoped for or expected her to do any better than that. Nice. Well, congratulations to Lisa then. She's well on her way to her led woman adventure right now we have two down for her right she's done the dirt marathon and now the dirt fit actually she's three down dirt marathon Mm -hmm. dirt 50 running and then dirt 50 or the silver rush riding as well so excellent work on uh on lisa's part um for knocking out actually more than she needs to at this point 
That's right. She did not have to do both the uh, the run and the mountain bike. You can do one or the other to do uh, to be a lead man slash lead woman. Uh, she did this because she wanted to test herself and uh, she wanted to see how she would do with uh, doing two hard events in close proximity, you know, chronologically to each other, because. When she gets to the uh, the Leadville 100 mountain bike race, the 100 running race is just one week later. So she wants she you know she wanted to see how she would react you know running or, or, or riding on very tired legs for an extended period of time. And now she knows she can do it. So and getting a little bit ahead of myself on this, but uh, there I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about my race now and that is the uh leadville silver rush um that we did yesterday mm -hmm. and i got a lot of stories on that i i don't know i i'm afraid this episode is going to go long hottie because i've got uh got a lot of stories to tell here all right we're um, gonna get to your we'll get to your silver rush uh, 50 race in just a minute now but uh, for part yeah. two we're going to talk about that race it's a popular qualifier for the leadville 100 so let's start with your prep for the day yeah, yeah, I, uh, I'm tending to jump, jump all over the place. You can tell uh, a, a a good hard uh, race weekend leaves you feeling really great, but also maybe not the clearest I have ever felt in my life. But I had some, uh, I had some really good aha moments in this race, and a lot of them have to do with planning ahead of time. Um, before I get and before I tell that story. I'm going to give you just, you know, a few of my key learnings that I noted down here. And, you know, the first one, and I think this is an important one because I have found myself doing it so many, so many times. You don't want to make last minute plan changes based on what you're hearing other people say, you know, at the venue or in the living room as you're planning things out and different people are talking about their plans. I almost did that this, uh, this race and I really would have regretted it if I had. Um, I, you know, I, as you know, I have a USWI uh, Airborne 3 uh, hydration pack and it, I have been having a lot of success with it. It is comfortable and it works great for me. And I was planning to use that uh, at least for the first half of the race and then maybe bottles for the second half. But, you know, sitting around talking with people about hydration packs and bottles and people are just saying, well, you know, this course isn't as technical as it usually is because they had to make some changes due to uh, all the, the record amount of snow here in Leadville this year. And I almost fell for it, Hottie. I almost scrapped my entire working plan in favor of someone else's plan that I had no experience with. Why would you do that? <laughs> I, I am easily influenced. I guess that is, that's the only thing I have to say for myself. But I mean, it's just, you know, I hear people, I'm like, well, they're smart people with a lot of experience. I should do what they say. Okay. But the fact is you should not change what you're going to eat or drink during this race. You shouldn't change what you're going to ride. You shouldn't change anything. Practice with what you are going to do in the Leadville 100. Get used to it and stick to it on race day. No matter what great you know insights other people will have, uh, in the end, I will say you know happy ending here. I did stick to my plan. I had a liter of Morton 160 in my USWI pack, just like I meant to. I had two empty bottles in the ca in my bottle cages just like I meant to in order to be able to fill those at the turnaround aid station, because I know that uh, I could hand those to my, uh, to, to people at the aid station and say, please fill these up because my own hands are functionally useless for detail work when I'm racing. And I knew that the, uh, you know, volunteers, which are, you know, mostly middle school kids, um, that they wouldn't know how to, you know, uh, unzip and extract and refill the bladder that comes with the use we pack. It's a complicated bladder system that works great, but only if you know how. Uh, anyway, I used a mix of six Roctane energy gels and six Morton energy gels for the day at you know a rate of one gel every half hour just you know like clockwork because i have my uh i have my garmin 830 gps make reminding me to do so and i brought along enough to get me through a six hour day although i hope to finish faster than that 
And while I'm going to get to more details on the day in a sec, I will say that sticking with my food plan was absolutely the right thing to do. I felt strong, no GI issues, no power spikes or crashes. The folks at the feed really, you know, they, they, they aren't just great at selling products at a great price. They get, they are willing to work with you to get you the right mix of what is going to work for you. And I, I had the best day, uh, you know, the best food plan a racer like me could ever have. And I got to thank the feed for it. Yeah. It's worth noting our podcast listeners can get a great price on a pack curated for Leadville racers containing a lot of the items we just mentioned for Fatty's Silver Rush 50. Go to thefeed.com mm -hmm. forward slash Leadville for our Leadville pack. And be sure to use that code Leadville15 for a 15% discount. You can also use that Lego 15 code for buying any amount of Morton at a 15% discount. I'm glad I used it, or rather glad that you used it, Fatty, at Silver Rush. Of course, I'll be using it, too, when I do my various races this summer, including uh, the Cream Puff up in Oregon. That's right, and I'll be using it next week at the Crusher and the Tusher. So, yeah, uh, we, we are having a lot of success with the stuff that we've been getting from the feed, so big thanks to them. So... Uh, you know, the stick with your plan, uh, aha moment, hottie, is just one side of my own personal, uh, my own personal coin. <laughs> it's, I have a couple of additional things that really st uh, struck home for me during this race before I detail out the day. So, uh, number one, of course, was stick with your plan. Number two is kind of the flip side that I was talking about. Be adaptable when good new opportunities present themselves. See, I didn't expect to have anyone available for me at the turnaround, but the morning of the race, while I'm standing at the starting line, I found out that Lisa's friend's husband, if you want to you know, track that out, uh, his name's Scott, great guy, he was going to be at the turnaround aid station uh, you know, to help his wife out, which meant that I could, if my day was going good, drop off my empty USWE pack halfway through the race and go with bottles for the second half of the race. And I had planned to be using bottles second half of the race. This just meant I could get rid of some weight that no longer had any value to me. And I did that. It worked great for me. So look for little things that can help you with that are not going to completely subvert your plan. Yeah, Third adaptable. Thing. Yeah, adaptable means like weather. Like if you wake up in the morning and yeah. you're like, "Oh my god, it's overcast and it looks like rain." Well, be ready to maybe wear a rain jacket going up Kevens when otherwise you wouldn't want to do that. It wouldn't be part of your plan. So adaptable and changing yeah. your plans are two different things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then my third one is uh, race when you're racing. Uh, I mean, that sounds circular, but it's true. That is, don't have your plan B ready to cut, uh, you know, cut your race off at the knees. I, mean, I don't think I've talked about this in the podcast, but you and I have talked about this offline. I've been having knee trouble uh, on my left knee for a couple of weeks. I don't know why, but it's my, my, my front, uh, you know, my left knee has just been really giving me trouble. And I've kind of, I had been before the race, given myself a couple of outs. You know, I could ride with Lisa if I needed to slow down a little bit because she'd be going slower after, since you had run 50 miles a, a previous day or go to a slow pace otherwise. And I realized partway through the race, uh, you know, really just probably about 10 miles into it. And I came across uh, my daughter, Melissa, who, uh, actually had blasted up Dutch Henry Hill and it claimed that women's, uh, the token for the women's Leadville 100 so that she's in Leadville this year. So awesome for her. Anyway, she had, you know, because she had done that, she was still recovering from sprinting up a hundred yards at, you know, 28%. And she was you know, kind of considering herself as like, well, maybe I should back off, take it easy, maybe ride with my mom. And I, she asked me, she's like, should I do that? And when she did ask me, it uh, something Yuri Hauswald uh, last year in Leadville, I had asked him something real similar and it recurred to me. Uh, uh, and he, he said, it's a race, man. And it, that's right. It is a race. You can ride with people other times. When you come to a race and you have race intentions, 
don't come saying it's a race, but come to race. And so I told Melissa, no. And I said, no, you know, race it. And I'm glad she did because she had a great day on the course and got on her age group podium. So that is just awesome. And it was a good answer for me too, because I, at that moment, I put away my own plan B and plan C and preemptive excuses and decided going forward, I'm, if I go to a starting line, it's always going to be with the thought that I am going to race it. And if something bad happens, like if my knee had really started giving me serious trouble, I'll make the decision to back off then. But I'm not going to go to starting lines with intention to maybe race. I'm going to go with the intention to race hard. And, you know, the day never goes perfect, but I don't want to have plans for me to bail out Mm -hmm. as soon as it doesn't go perfect. Well, to quote Yuri Hoswell directly, he would say, it's an <laughs> effing race, man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's the way Yuri, you know, that's the way Yuri rolls. Here's my bad uh, story of a plan B. My first year at Leadville, mm. I taped on my top tube two sets of splits, one for a sub nine, yeah. one for a sub 10. What did I do? I went right for plan B. Didn't take long either. Yep. Suddenly I was racing for a sub 10 instead of a sub nine which I probably had the fitness for. I probably had the fitness for gold. I ended up with silver. I ended back in Leadville in 2013, redoing the whole thing. So yeah, plan Bs will uh, uh, will eventually and quickly become attractive if you've got one right in front of your face. That's right, because you, you're going to be hurting. You know you're going to be hurting. It's, it's, it's 100 miles at super high altitude. It's going to hurt. And, you know, everyone goes into a dark place and we're going to have a whole show on getting through that dark place before the, and before the race begins, you know, give you a little bit of armor against those bad places, but don't start the race with intention to give yourself an out of your, of your goals and your plans and your dreams. Go into the race fully intending to hit that thing, whatever it is that you want to actually get it done. And so here's, here's kind of my flip side of that coin, and that is don't be superstitious. And this time I, uh, I'm, I'm pointing my finger directly at me. <laughs> so I ran my tires harder than necessary yesterday because I was overreacting to tire trouble that I had in this race last year. It's the only time this year that I, I, I ran... 25 uh, PSI in the back, 23 up front. I usually run 20 up front, 21 in the back, which is just perfect for me. I haven't got a flat the whole year riding at that pressure, and it is just right. But I had hard tires, which made an already choppy and rocky course feel that choppier and rockier. Just because I was thinking back, well, last year I flatted, and I don't want that to happen again. And so I ran my tires super hard, just because you had a bad, you know, bad luck on a course one time. Don't overcorrect. Don't swing that pendulum so far like I did. I, you know, I, who knows how much faster, how much more comfortable I would have been at, at a few psi lower. But it would have been significant. It would have been meaningful. I would have felt better by the time I got to that last downhill. Mm-hmm. And remember, there's a difference between superstitions and mm-hmm. race habits. Like superstition, for instance, there was a baseball player, his name was Wade Boggs. He was a great hitter. His superstition was to eat chicken before each baseball game. That's a superstition. (laughs) He would have been a great hitter no matter what. Now, it's different from having a good race habit. Good race habit is planning your day out, doing things in a certain order, making sure things flow in a certain way. Those are good race habits, you know, inspecting your bike, uh, those aren't superstitions. Those are good race habits. So there's there's a fine line there. You don't have to get nuts all about it. Like, oh, I can't, I can't step on a crack because I might not have a yeah. great level. No, no, that's a superstition. But having your bike prep, doing things in a certain order, those are good race habits. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about speaking of bikes. Let's talk mm. a little bit about the bike you rode for the Silver Rush Fifty. 
Yeah. Uh, so a quick re uh, recap on the build I have for this bike. I've detailed it before in a previous episode, but I'm riding my uh, specialized Epic hardtail thing weighs practically negative pounds, uh, a Fox 32 step cast fork, which, uh, the more I ride the more I like, uh, Shimano XTR for the drive train and brakes, uh, best shifting I've ever had on any bike, any bike period, including road bikes, right? Smooth, the fastest shipping shifting I've ever had. And then for the, my contact points, I, I, I realized a couple of days ago, Envy's got my contact points covered. It's my Envy M5 Barnes, uh, M6 stem, uh, you know, it's got my hands covered the seat post. They don't make the saddle, but the seat post matters a ton as I'm sure you'll agree. And I've got the one with the setback and then the M525 wheels. Uh, I, I have the Maxxis Ardent race, uh, 2.35s out and back, uh, both front and back, I should say. And I had no problems with any of it. Uh, excessive pressure, notwithstanding, uh, the, considering the beating that this course delivers, that is saying something hotty it's a rocky course you know lots of embedded rocks lots of loose rocks lots of choppy uh washboard uh uh dirt road i, re I remember actually there's one guy with a catastrophically ruined seat post about i would say 32 miles into the race and he was venting his rage using words that Yuri would use, but much more angrily, um, <laughs> and extremely loud. Uh, I've been there. Uh, I've, I've had that trouble before. I've had a broken seat post before. So, you know, I, I feel for the guy. I've been that guy, but I was also super happy that I had the very best components that you can get. It is so confident and nice, uh, knowing that when you're on Envy, your stuff is basically, I won't say it's bomb proof. Everything, you know, nothing is perfect. And, you know, some things will break if you hit them hard enough. But my Envy stuff, it, it, it doesn't break. Everything is just, uh, it's, got my, it's got my butt, my hands, my, gr uh, my ground touch points, all just beautifully covered. And I want to talk about one thing actually from here, Hadi, for a sec, that is a little bit less about the Envy function and a little bit more about form. I mean, you've noticed, anyone who has seen Envy stuff has noticed, it is just beautifully designed. And they have one thing that I've done this year that just makes it really look extra special. You've seen the pictures, right? I put on the custom decals for, uh, for my 525 wheels uh, that I got from Envy. I gave them the Pantone color for the accent, uh, accent color from my uh, specialized Epic. It, it's actually Pantone 331, just in case you're curious. I have, the, have that number memorized. And they will make you decals in a couple of colors to match whatever color your bike is and send them over. It took about 90 minutes. Uh, I just one evening while watching the movie, put them on. It looks so good. It takes your envy, you, you, the beautiful envy look you've already got and just notches it up to 11. Yeah, a clean bike is a fast bike, and so is a sexy bike. Uh, you can learn more about all of Envy's wheels and components, many of which seem like they're made with the Leadville 100 in mind, but which can handle pretty much anything you can throw at them for any terrain at Envy. That's E-N-V-E dot com. Okay, on to race day, Fatty. How did the race go, the Silver Rush 50? Oh, well, I already told you that the the way the race starts is just horrible and surreal. Uh, I do like the way that uh, Lifetime lets you self-seed in this one. They say, you know, if you think you're going to do the race in six and a half hours or less, go into the Gold Corral. If you think you're going to do more than six and a half hours, go into the Silver Corral. And then the Silver Corral starts five minutes later. It's chip time, so it doesn't matter. But it, it lets people kind of, you know, make an honest seeding. I was surprised and impressed at there was a, a reason reasonable number of people going into each of them and at least at the beginning of the race I didn't I wasn't having to you know work my way around people who you know should have been you know seated themselves to the very back who had seated themselves to the front there was a really good vibe about the the people in this race just in general the racers seemed really friendly and courteous and I think you know you know hats off to lifetime for having this kind, you know, encouraging this kind of vibe and to the racers for coming to this and having a fun race, uh, you know, in general, anyway, uh, pushing my bike up this giant sledding hill, 
uh, is just painful. And my heart rate, I, I wasn't wearing a heart rate monitor, but I could feel that I was absolutely at my limit before I ever crossed the timing mat that says the race has begun. It's, you know, this isn't even an official part of the race. This is the incredibly difficult thing you have to do to get to the starting line. And it kind of takes you to a funnel. And so once I finally got there, had to stand for a minute and let my heart rate settle down a little bit, funnel onto the course, which is a downhill single track. I made a lot of care and I don't know if I was annoying doing this, but I don't care. I was very, very, very vocal in calling stuff out. Hairpin coming up, you know, people slowing ahead, things like that. I just don't want people running into me. I've seen it happen too many times. I saw one guy at the bottom of this single track covered in mud and, well, not mud, dust and blood uh, because, you know, something had happened to him and it's in the first mile of the race. It's very sad. So for, for any race that it has a lot of dust and a lot of turns and is downhill, call stuff out. Be the guy who lets people know what is going on. I think that it's worth doing. How about a bell? Would a bell have any assistance? Uh, no, I mean, it, we were, it, it was more like, you know, we were within six inches of each other's wheels. So we were just riding very close yeah. and it was very dusty. I don't know. It, it wasn't that you didn't know where people were. It's just that there were so many of us. So just calling stuff out. Right. Even though there's not uh, any single track for a number of miles at the LT100, you will run into traffic, folks, and you'll be be prepared to do the same thing. Just because it's not a single track race, as soon as you get to Kevin's, you're going to find a log jam, unless you're in the front corral. You're going to find some sort of log jam down there. And so just be prepared to, to call out to your fellow racer that you're moving around or that you're going backwards or that you want to stop or whatever. But uh, verbalize your intentions out there. Yep, call it out, be friendly. So uh, once uh, we, I got onto the course and started climbing, I felt so good. I was, had been worried about my knee, turned out my knee did not even enter my mind for, it, it, I would say, the first three quarters of the race. And I, the course was wide enough, and there lots of double track in this, that I could get around folks and climb. And you, Hottie, will be glad to know that I spent time climbing both seated and standing. I've been improving my uh, climbing quiver. Uh, so Jonathan Lee will be glad to know uh, <laughs> that I, I've been working on my uh, climbing uh, climbing approaches as well. Uh, Got to say, I really, you know, I, I, I was using the lockout on my step cast, the 32 step cast all the time. And I really liked the remote on that. Um, it is very tactile. I can tell without looking down. It's not like the plunger on rock shock style remotes where you, you know, push in and you've got, and you've got suspension push out and it doesn't, but it's, you know, kind of feels the same no matter where it is with the step cast. You can tell by the, the, the position and the just tactily whether it is in or out and so you know whether you need to flip it or not so you know kudos uh kudos to the folks at, at fox for this and then like i said the shifting on my xtr xtr drivetrain never missed a shift perfect all day it was just it was elegant and wonderful you know shimano is just killing it the, uh these days mm -hmm. um, that new hi that new hyperglide rear cassette is the whole honestly, reason to be on the new 12 speed shimano Oh, it is. I mean, you, you hear the word game changer all the time, but it's a game changer. Just, you know, fantastic shifting. I just loved it. Um, I So the hydration pack was super nice to have because uh, I could get to a drink fast, which is really helpful when you are in a very crowded field and reaching down for a bottle means, you know, at least glancing down for a second. It is nice to be able to just flip the tube up into your mouth. Um then a big dirt rat, uh, the big dirt climb out to up about to 12k to 12,000 feet. Did a lot of passing in that. I was surprised that as hard as I was going, my knee seemed to be fine. Uh, bet, best it's been in at least two weeks. Um, on the two way traffic on the way down, um, and this this reminded me a lot of Columbine uh, because it's two way, and so you really have to hold your line. It was pretty choppy, a lot of rocks, um, and this is one place where I, you know, I felt kind of bad about myself. I got past so much, Hottie. Uh, it reminded me, you know, for the first time in what would be dozens of times in the day 
the descending is really my Achilles heel. Uh, there are people who would pass me on every single descent and I would pass them back on every single climb. And I, I, you know, I, I was just, I thought back several times to the really great interview uh, that you did with Lee McCormick uh, in the most recent episode of the show that, you know, it's like, I, I need to learn some of that downhill Kung Fu because I have none of it. And I am not a complete racer. I, that's what I kept going through my head. It's like, I am a good climber, you know, for someone of my weight and my age, I can out climb so many people, most people. I'm a, I'm a really good climber. And then I lose all of that advantage on the downhills. So uh, I, it, that is something that I think next year is going to be my real focus is to, I, I don't, I don't want to become the best downhiller. I don't expect to do that, but I want to be someone who doesn't lose, who basically gives up any advantage that I get in my climbs on every downhill I ever do. Yep. You need to work on your hinge. That's what Lee would tell you. In fact, I was working That's on right. mine uh, yesterday and just thinking about my hinge, bending at the hips, uh, pushing my chest down as things get rough. It really does work, but you do ha you, you can't wait till race day to try to implement it. Got to go out and work That's at right. it, get used to it. And it does, it does work. Yeah. You know, maybe there's time in, you know, between now and race day where I can at least make some little incremental improvements and that would might make a big difference. You know, when you, it's a race while, you know, it's a, it's an all day race, Leadville 100 is, but for someone like me, I'm looking to gain, you know, some minutes and, you know, maybe if there is a minute or two minutes or three minutes or five minutes that I could gain in this race, uh, by downhilling better, boy, that would be worth a lot because that would be, uh, you know, that would be free minutes for me where I'm just going faster without pedaling harder. Uh, that would be, that would be a real boon. So anyway, uh, descend on, uh, it would, we descended to a segment that is new to the course. Uh, it is a rocky, loose 1.2 mile segment that is part of a longer three mile climb. And that really tested me. A lot of people walked a lot of it, but like I said, I am climbing well this year. And I just went to that 51 tooth uh, gear in, in the back on my XTR and just sat, you know, sat there and turned at a constant steady rate. It tested me, but I did great. Um, I could have cleaned it. I'm confident of that. But someone had some bad luck right in front of me and they fell over into the line, had to dismount there. What can you do? It's a race. It's crowded. So what? But it's not like it's, it was going to change whether I uh, won or took second place in the race. And so I just walked for a little while. We hit uh, 12,000 feet uh, after that climb or close to 12,000. I'll have to check, but it felt like about 12,000 feet. You're at high altitude a lot in the silver rush. And it is good practice to do this race to see how you react to altitude for the Leadville 100. I'm happy to say that, you know, having been in Leadville for about five days, I felt good. I felt good at 12,000 feet. I didn't have the lightheadedness I would have expected. So downhill, more or less to the turnaround aid station, which has the single most cruel approach I've ever seen in an aid station. You have to have to, and there, there's no option about this. I'm sure that the, the winners of the race, you coast up to it and it is just a, I would say a 25% rock garden, you know, it's, it's softball sized rocks, loose, way too steep to climb. Uh, honestly, they're just being mean putting it there, Hottie. So I uh, hiked up that, crossed the timing mat, uh, filled up my bottles with uh, one with water, one with rock tain. It's what they had. And um, then coasted down, met my uh, wife's friend's husband, shucked my pack off, which meant I was trusting that there would be no rain for my race day, which means I hadn't learned a lot from Lisa's race day. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turned out I would be only mildly wrong. I think I got rained on for like 15 seconds during the day, uh, just enough to feel nice, honestly. Uh, then uh, it was just climbing again, you know, ground away, sort of passing people on climbs, getting passed on descents. And un unfortunately for me, uh, you hit the highest point of the race about 10 miles before the end of the race. And then it's just descending for the rest of it. And so it was kind of disheartening, you know, being passed by people. I had climbed past 
truly long ago. I mean, I really lost, gave up a lot of places, but the good news was for me, uh, the race ends with sort of a, a little surprise half mile or so of climbing on single track. And I was ready for it. Having seen Lisa go up there, uh, the day before, I think I passed three or five people back, uh, in that section with some, with some heat. I was, uh, I was definitely giving it my all for the finish, uh, and finished with a four hours and 55 time, which is plenty good to get me in the red corral, uh, which is in the first wave. So unless they change the corral qualifying times due to the course change, uh, I am qualified into the red corral for the Leadville 100. And that is the first wave. And I'm super happy about that. Uh, Lisa finished about an hour later. uh, And I mean, consider that she finished one hour later than I did after the previous day, having run that entire course. Mm -hmm. That's why she is the hammer. So did you move up in corral positions? Is that what happened there? Did I do what again? Did you move up in corral positions for the LT100? No, I was already set for the red corral, but now I feel like I've earned it. You know, uh-huh. I, I've I've earned it for this year. You know, I, I've I've had it before. I've been as fast as silver before, but um, no, I'm uh, I'm I'm all set for red for this year, and feel like uh, you know I belong there. Mm-hmm. All right, then. So. Good job out there, Silver Rush Fifty in the books for both of you, and now the Crusher and the Tusher less than a week away. Yeah. Confession here, Fatty. I have had something come loose during the Leadville Trail 100. In fact, it was my first oh, race no. there. Thankfully, it was not critical, a water bottle cage bolt, but it was preventable. Fatty, yeah. how about you? Anything ever rattle loose at an inopportune moment? I, I, I've i had stuff water, uh, rattle loose, uh, not during Leadville. I'm, I'm pretty fastidious about making my mechanic really go over my bike. <laughs> Good job. Uh, I was able to tighten the water bottle bolt during the middle of the race, but it cost me a couple minutes. So all sorts of things can come loose on a mountain bike. In this episode, in our mountain bikes uh, maintenance segment, we engage in a real nuts and bolts discussion with our chief mechanic, Ryan Morse. We're back with Ryan Morse of Diablo Wheelworks here on the Leadville Trail 100 show. Today, we're going to talk about what I call fasteners or nuts and bolts. Nuts and bolts. To, to other people. The nuts and bolts of a bike Got maintenance a few here. loose nuts and bolts. Sir. Uh, we do. Yeah, we do. And particularly on mountain bikes yes. where we're rattling down hills all Correct. the time, things shake loose. What are the things, what are the bolts, the nuts and bolts you see shake loose on mountain bikes? I've seen everything come loose, to be perfectly honest. What I see most, uh, I would say, and they tend to be the most used and or most fiddled with or adjusted Stem bolts are going to be one of them, a uh, face plate for handlebar, um, steer tube clamp, compression, pl- uh, compression plug adjustment for the, you know, headset bearings. Those tend to, I find, come loose um, and or are loose when I service bikes. Uh, handlebar stuff like brake levers, whether it be road or mountain shifters for that matter, a lot of times they are either under torqued or over torqued. And you have to be obviously very careful uh, on any handlebar, but especially carbon. Mm -hmm. How about these big bolts we have, we now call through axles. Some people call them skewers, but they're through axles. Those come loose on us? They, you know, Properly adjusted, they shouldn't. Um, how to properly adjust them is kind of the uh, new thing most people are having a little bit of trouble with. Uh, similar in in practice to a quick release, in a sense, with a quick release, you use sort of the feel and the look of an imprint on your hand to tell you how tight was too tight, not tight enough. My rule of thumb with quick releases is you got to use a little bit of effort. If you got a little smirk on your face when you're done, when you're do, when you're closing it, good indication that at least you've tightened it. Mm-hmm. Um, in a sense, with through axles, some of them are similar to quick releases that way, where you spin them tight and then you lever it closed. In that sense, I will say it's very similar to that quick release. A little grimace under pressure from your hand, and you're good to go. Uh, some of the others that are literally just turning tight, um, I will say the same thing. You got to use a little bit of effort to get it tight. In that sense, it's easy to over tighten some of these things when you really reef down hard on them. So I would say not a lot of uh, aggression to be put on these items to tighten, 
but a little bit of effort is needed. Yeah, they'll they'll hold their own yeah. as long as you've got them snug. Correct. And and truly, you don't want to be stuck on the trail trying to undo one no. of these things with a small little uh, multi tool. Correct. So you want to be able to get them off as well. Correct. A water bottle cage bolts. Yes. Now, um, a lot of lead villers don't like to wear packs. They like water Correct. bottle cages, but these bolts do come loose they and can, they can be problematic. They right? can come loose. Um, I'll always heavily suggest one: don't use alloy water bottle bolts. Try not to use alloy anything bolts um they are lighter absolutely they save a little bit of weight but they tend to be more easily over tightened and then you they break which mm -hmm. is not fun but yeah you know every bolt on the bike in the actual practice should be checked before any ride in the reality of things most of us do not do that i would say before any race check everything in a sense of all major fasteners there is no one that is more important than another mm -hmm. and as we're going over our fasteners when do we use grease on the threads and when do we sure. use loctite sure uh, i'm i'm sure whatever i say there will be a, an argument against it but in my practice what i've learned throughout my doings over the years um, bolts that get used a lot or adjusted a lot, let's say like a stem seat post, uh, I tend to recommend grease. If the bolts come with Loctite already on them or pre-installed thread locker, uh, I would say that is fine for a while until it wears off under use. You can then choose to use Loctite uh, in that sense, but bolts like for stems and, and seat posts tend to need to be adjusted a lot. So if you're using Loctite there, you break that seal, you then need to reapply it. So if it's needed, absolutely. If the manufacturer suggests, suggests it, absolutely Loctite. Um, where I tend to use Loctite rather than grease is on bolts that don't get much use. Rotor bolts, caliper bolts, um, even brake lever bolts, things like that where like on a road bike, brake levers are, are rarely moved. And I find a little bit of Loctite there can make things a little better. Mm -hmm. And another thing we want to also focus on when it comes to fasteners are brake levers and shift yes. uh, mechanisms. These and bolts drop, we want- dropper post, anything and, on the handlebar. Anything on the handlebar, we want to be careful about how tight those Correct. are. We actually want things to move up here, Correct. don't we? Correct. Um, what I find most most of those bolts, I will go to, you know, a low torque rating, you know, whatever the manufacturer spec is, it's actually, I, I will find a little higher than you need. Um, especially on carbon, you have to be careful not to, the, to have the, whatever, whatever clamp you're tightening to not have it crimp the handlebar. And the other point too, with keeping these bolts on your brake yes. levers and your shifters on, on the looser side is in the uh, event of a crash, you actually want those levers to move right. and not rip your carbon bars apart. Right. So as I like to say the not too tight side rather than not too loose. Right. There we go. And another uh, hottie tip. Uh, look, the, the easiest specialty tool you can own is a torque wrench. Go out and invest in a torque wrench. Everyone should have one. Yes. You can find one on the cheaper end that'll still at least keep you in the ballpark and keep you from breaking it's, things. It's worth, you'll find anything from, you know, from, for, that's halfway decent from, you know, $45, $50 and up. It's worth the investment when you realize the uh, parts you're tightening are sometimes hundreds of dollars it's worth having uh, a couple bucks invested in it. If you need your bike completely checked over every nut and bolt and you're in the LA area, Ryan Morris, Dablo Wheelworks thank is you, your sir. man. Thank you, thank you. Ah, yes, torque wrench ownership. I consider that purchase as the moment I became a serious cyclist. I now have five torque wrenches. Fatty, what's your <laughs> torque wrench count? You can never have too many torque wrenches. Uh, I have a set that are preset to common stop points, uh, five nanometers, six nanometers, so forth. I won't count that set as multiple wrenches. So lumping those together as one, I have a couple others. So I'm, I'm going to guess. I'm not going out to the garage right now because I'm in Leadville, but I think I have three. Okay. I have five. And of my five, my favorite is the one I got from Shimano's Pro line of gear. There's actually two in the Pro Bike Gear line. Mine is the one mm -hmm. more suited for travel. It comes in a case. Inside is the wrench, five bits, three of them are Allen, two Torx, an extension, and a manual written in like 30 languages. Uh, <laughs> the Torx wrench, it'll handle fasteners with specs between 3 and 15 nm. 
So stems, seat post clamps, saddle clamps, caliper mount mounting bolts, the stuff you should be checking often. What I like most about this little wrench is that the tips of the bits do not have chrome plating on them. When I put nice. the socket into an Allen or Torx bolt, I never feel like the tool is going to slip in the head. I just hate that. Oh, yeah. It's the, the bits actually feel like they're gripping the inside of that head. It makes for a more positive and confident feel as I'm tightening the most important bolts on my bike. Look, any torque wrench is better than none, but if you need one or want a better one, check out the Pro Bike Gear Torque Wrench. Yep, and Pro Bike Gear has its own webpage with all kinds of bike accessories, including these uh, really great tools that Heidi likes so much. You can find the page by going to bike.shimano.com. Just look for the Pro logo on the homepage, and we will also have a link in the show notes for this episode at leadville100podcast.com. <music> Hottie, while here for the Silver Rush, a lot of people told me how much they like the expertise we've brought into the episodes this season. Folks like our nutrition expert, Roxanne Vogel. Yeah, Roxanne is back from her record-breaking Everest Summit trip with some great altitude and nutrition tips Leadville racers can use. Roxy, welcome back to the show as well as to the U.S. Thanks, Fatty. Good to be back. Yeah, and you have an amazing story to tell, which I think has something to do with your job as Nutrition and Performance Research Manager at Goo Energy Labs. Yeah, so um, about a month ago, I returned from a speed attempt on Mount Everest, and the goal was to be the fastest round-trip Everest expedition ever. Um, typically, it takes about two months for somebody to go and climb and come back from Mount Everest just because it takes so long to acclimate. Mm -hmm. um, but using some of the resources I had at work, uh, altitude chambers, uh, things like that, and strategic nutrition, we were able to do a round trip uh, expedition in two weeks door to door from San Francisco. So pretty awesome and uh, really hard. <laughs> two weeks instead of two months. That's amazing. Yeah, this was not your normal trip, Fatty, to, to Everest and back. I mean, most people go to base camp and they sit there for two months. But Roxanne, what was the particulars about doing this? What what, what were the biggest hurdles about getting this, this expedition done? So in order to make it possible, I essentially did my acclimatization at sea level here where I live in Berkeley, uh, so the Bay Area at sea level. Um, but three months before I left, I started sleeping in and at work, we have a hypoxico chamber. So working also in uh, simulated altitude. So essentially it's like living in a bubble for three months. I was trying to get a majority of my time spent at simulated altitude. So, you know, it took a lot of training, a lot of preparation and uh, some serious commitment to, to this project to get it done. But um, some of the nutrition stuff that we innovated at Goo for this trip specifically really came in handy. Um, so that was definitely a big part of the success of the project. Yeah. So tell, tell us a little bit about that. What, what, uh, nutrition innovations did you take with you? So we came up with a few different, uh, formulations, one of which was this Everest bar, which, um, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to want to eat at altitude. So I wanted something that was really energy dense. So high calorie, mm -hmm. delicious, but also, lightweight and portable and durable. So it was this bar that was essentially a coconut, macadamia nut, and a cacao-based uh, bar, but had some performance ingredients in it as well. Um, I would eat that. Yeah, it was it so sounds good. Great. I had a hard time not eating it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we had the Everest bar, we called it. I also did my own formulation of a Roctane drink mix, which we ended up naming Roxtane. So it was all the things you know and love about Roctane drink mix. So the high calorie, uh, you know, the amino acids and everything, caffeine, but also had some cognitive performance uh, ingredients in there to help with brain function at altitude. And then we also did a custom goo energy gel that had some additional ketone salts and other cognitive function ingredients in there. So all of these things, I took up the mountain and was able to test them out and they were fantastic. I am curious whether any of those are going to go to market. 
You know, there's always the possibility, and we work with a lot of different populations that would have some of these needs. So whether it's for high altitude or, um, you know, even like a military application, there are certainly some instances where these products would be beneficial for other folks besides just climbing Mount Everest. I'm just thinking of some podcast listeners uh, who might be super interested in this, some Leadville racers, perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I love formulating products for high altitude, so I could definitely see like a, a one-off run for like the Leadville series. If people were interested in it, um, I encourage them to let us know at gooenergylabs.com. Put me on the beta test list. Absolutely. Now, your diet was more fat-based uh, for the climb up Everest and for, for the amount of the kind of nutrients you needed once you made the ascent? So it was before the trip. Um, I did focus more on, you know, high quality fats and proteins and uh, less on the starchy carbohydrates before I left just because I wanted to be well fat adapted in case something went wrong and I wasn't able to eat um, on summit day or any part of the climb. I'd be able to essentially burn my own body fat for fuel, which ended up saving my butt literally mm -hmm. on summit day. But um, once I got on the mountain, it is actually much easier to process carbohydrates and it takes less oxygen to process carbohydrates at altitude. So that was my primary fuel source. Once I hit the ground at base camp at 17,000 feet, it was mm -hmm. all carbs all day. I was eating right. one time um, pasta wrapped around a mashed potato with balsamic <laughs> vinegar glaze. Like I was just, I didn't even wow. know who I was at that point. I'm like, that's all right. Yum. Just all the carbs. Yum. So tell, talk to us about, um, first of all, there's a big fascination with the death zone and what happens to the human body up there, but we want to focus in on Roxanne's GI tract. No offense, Roxanne, but we want to know how did your stomach, how did your GI tract react once you really started getting up that mountain? Yeah. So, you know, for the people who aren't aware, the death zone is considered anything above about 25, 26,000 feet. And this is the elevation at which the human body literally starts eating itself for survival, um, just because there's not enough oxygen for it to survive. So it will start, you know, cannibalizing its own tissue, its own muscle. Um, and another thing is your, your system starts to shut down. So your GI tract just doesn't want to accept any nutrients at that point. And for me, I am fortunate in that I'm usually able to eat calories all the way up a mountain. Like I can eat my way up any mountain. And, uh, uh, I think in this case, I would have been just fine had it not been for, this was my first time wearing an oxygen mask. Um, so once mm. you get to the death zone, generally you put on oxygen. Uh, and that was when I realized that it's really difficult to actually pull the mask away from your face and then eat or drink anything. Cause you have to like slide it underneath and it's like a one inch gap that you can kind of pull it away from your face. And that really changed the game for me. So come summit day, you know, I was out there for 16 hours and I ended up taking in about 200 calories and a half a liter of water. It was, it was amazing that I was able to push as hard as I did for that long and so little, but, uh, you know, it goes to, to show that a fat adaptation strategy before anything like that can really save you in those situations. But yeah, it was, a uh, it was shocking. I really want to hear the full, like the full length feature length story of this at some point right now, I, I think probably we ought to constrain in a little bit and say, so what, what, what did you learn that would be uh, applicable to our listeners, to Leadville racers? So definitely the biggest takeaway for me nutrition wise was, you know, it doesn't matter if you have the best laid nutrition plan. And in my case, like your own custom nutrition products and, and everything, but if you can't actually get the nutrition into your body for whatever reason, it doesn't do you any good. So, hmm. you know, I would say for your listeners, make sure that not only have you practiced your nutrition strategy and you know what it's going to be ahead of time, like have a plan, but make sure that on the course, you're going to be able to actually implement the plan. So, you know, if you haven't ridden the course before, keep in mind, it might be more technical than you thought. You might not be able to use your hands as much as you would on another course. And so you may not be able to grab your bottle from its cage. So just be very cognizant of things like that and plan for that. So um, that would be my number one yeah. piece of advice. Yeah, Hadi, this has got to remind you of the hydration pack versus bottles episode we did right. uh, very recently. Yeah, we had a recent guest, Larissa Connors, the past champion, say, look, uh, 
she's fine with showing up uh, in the front red corral, or rather the front gold corral with a hydration pack, despite all her competitors around her going with bottles because she knows the hydration pack, that nozzle is going to get fluid in, into her when a bottle just may not. I was wondering what else, Roxanne, you learned about going to Everest and about, about being ready for Everest nutrition-wise. What did that mountain teach you? Well, I know in my research um, before, I've always been fascinated by high altitude. And, um, you know, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that once you arrive at a higher elevation than you're used to, it's actually really difficult for your body to acclimate. So it takes a lot of energy. And so you're burning more calories just laying around kind of doing nothing. Even if you're say tapering before a race, you're burning more calories at altitude than you are at sea level. So you need to kind of take that into account and maybe eat a little bit more. And I would recommend a little bit more carbohydrate because it takes less oxygen to break down carbohydrate. So that, and then you're also dehydrating at the same time because you're blood is going to try and concentrate itself. So it's called hemoconcentration. It tries to uh, diminish some of the plasma volume. So you might find yourself urinating more frequently when you first arrive at altitude, and that's just your body's way to acclimate. So it's trying to concentrate those oxygen carrying red blood cells. Um, so that being said, you want to really stay on top of your hydration strategy and drink more than you think you ought to. Mm-hmm. Well, Fatty, I think we learned a lot here, even though we're not uh, riding to the top of Everest, riding to the top of Columbine, there's certainly some parallels here. First of all, you, you, all you, every racer should have a great nutrition plan, but also think about the delivery system, whether it be across a rough road, whether it be putting something in a camelback, how are you going to get this, this well-laid nutrition plan into your system? It's very important. Practice it in Leadville. Once you hit the ground, go out there and go, can I drink from my bottle? Can I grab food from my pocket as I'm going from the bottom of a power line over the pipeline or what have you? Uh, the other thing is when you get into Leadville, remember this, what, what Roxanne just told us, that just being at altitude, even doing nothing, means you are burning more calories. So adjust your plate as you get to Leadville. And also remember that your red blood cell concentration is changing that means you're probably going to the bathroom more, so you need to keep hydrating and probably hydrate a little more or more than you would at sea level. All right, coming up next time with Roxanne, we'll be a month out from race day. So we're, we're going to zoom in on your race day strategy and your plan for those last 30 days before the big day in Leadville. Howdy, we always learn so much from Roxanne. She really brings a mountain cred to her segment. Yeah, mountain cred in quotation marks, that's for sure. When you go up Everest, <laughs> you got it then. You know what it's all about when it comes to elevation and nutrition. All right, let's wrap up Season 2, Episode 18. It's been a monumental one of the Leadville 100 podcast presented by Floyd's of Leadville. If you like our little show, give us a five-star rating and review over at Apple Podcasts. Also, share it with your other cycling friends. And please support our sponsors. Let them know you appreciate them making this show possible. Meanwhile, if you have ideas or questions for us, head to the Leadville100podcast.com comment section and get in touch. Awesome. And follow us on Twitter. I am at Fat Cyclist. Hottie is at Michael Houghton. And you can find us on Facebook as well, where we are both active in the Leadville 100 MTB Participants Group. Good luck in your training. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next month in Leadville. Next month. Woo.